Uh, my name is Walter Boyd. I'm the president and CEO of Adaptive 3D. We're a Dallas-based company that makes uh, photoelastomers. Um, I have a background in computer science and AI uh, back in, in uh, my master's years. I did a PhD at Georgia Tech in, in material science and engineering, um, and then was a faculty member at UT Dallas from 2010 to 2017, uh, where we spun it Adaptive. Uh, we've developed some proprietary chemistries based on thiols that allow us to mass manufacture uh, polymer resins using high throughput DLP. So lots of little mirrors moving really, really quickly. Um, we're in Dallas, a few miles from TI's headquarters. Um, I've been a part of a number of big uh, DARPA programs and in artificial intelligence, and we're really interested in understanding how to use implicit data representations and algorithms to rapidly micro-architect materials and overcome some of the curse of dimensionality problems as we scale additive manufacturing towards trillions of bits of information per second that need to be processed to enable large-scale, high-resolution uh, rubber and plastics processing. All right, thank you for having us here. And uh, my name is Michelle Bachman. I'm CEO of 3D Control Systems. I uh, was at an HP 3D printing before I came over here last year, and before that, I spent 17 years at GE in multiple businesses from GE Healthcare, GE Automation, and then lastly GE Digital in industrial cybersecurity as well as connecting machines using the Predix platform. And then before that, I was in metrology and automotive, so I'm a mechanical engineer, so I have a manufacturing background. I ran multiple PLs, and I have a digital sort of manufacturing lead throughout my career. Um, came over last year when I was still at HP as an advisor to 3D Control Systems and an investor. And when I learned what the platform was that they had already built uh, around workflow management for uh, 3D printers on the desktop side, and they had 140,000 users, and just very impressive with the platform that they had built out from design through delivery. Um, I knew that there was a gap in the industry on the industrial side, and so I. Uh, I said, you know, hey, how do we work even closer? And John, um, who's right here, our founder, he, um, he asked me to come on as CEO, and we built out a new platform that we just launched a couple months ago. And it's really that digital thread, in, is, which works nicely, nicely with our topic today, around connecting design, build prep, simulation software, hardware, whether it's robotics, 3D printing, CNC machines, whatever, and then post-processing quality, and has sort of that traceability that you can uh, you need for for parts in different industries. So that's a little bit about me and a little bit about the the company I'm I'm leading. Thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Federico Shimarella. I'm the president and CTO at MXD. That's Manufacturing Times Digital. So we are one of sixteen of the. National Manufacturing Innovation Institute, so you're probably all familiar with America Makes. Um, we're based out of Chicago, so our focus really, we're a member-based, membership-based organization, public-private partnership. Uh, we basically fund um, projects in, in the space of digital manufacturing, so from design to future factory to supply chain, uh, uh, much like Michelle said, that, that digital thread, so we're trying to help companies on their digital journey to ensure um, they know what they need to do. Um, every step of the way, and we are also the National Center for Cybersecurity and Manufacturing as designated by DOD, so certainly when you're talking about IoT, cybersecurity is going to play an important role that convergence of IoT and IoT, so very excited. Um, prior to that, I was at Northern Illinois University for 12 years, uh, did a lot of work in additive, metal additive, in situ process monitoring, so always looking at practical ways to, to bring these technologies to, to industry, so excited to be here with this uh, distinguished panel today. Well, thank you uh, for the invitation and thank you for attending. Uh, my name is Pierre Vieux-Mura. I apologize in advance, you, you hear my accent. Uh, I came to the US only a few years ago uh, from a background in uh, injection molding and CNC machining equipment in Europe. Uh, I did some rapid uh, injection molding in the US then and two years ago founded Qualified 3D. So we are primarily a consulting company helping uh, customers who want to migrate towards uh, 3D printing, uh, the projects that they currently do in uh, low volume injection molding and CNC machining. Uh, we're based in Detroit, Michigan. So today I'm not here to speak about qualified 3D specifically, uh, but about a project we've been developing for Automation Alley. 
So Automation Alley is the Michigan uh, Industry 4.0 Knowledge Center, something similar to MXD in a different field. Uh, we help primarily uh, small and medium-sized companies move into uh, Industry 4.0 through IoT, through automation, uh, through uh, AI. And uh, Automation AI used uh, some federal funding available through the CARES uh, grant process uh, last year to, um, to create a large program uh, buying 3D printers uh, with money channels through two counties and creating some type of strategic stockpile. So 300 companies, all of them receive one printer and we created a networked organization helping them using these printers. But now we're working towards uh, creating a shared manufacturing platform, uh, so an open platform on a non-profit uh, basis. And so we work at uh, adding machines, so we have 300 machines today, we probably would be at around 1,000 machines by the end of the year. Uh, we help our members also access uh, knowledge and software that we are developing on that shared platform, which is a blockchain enabled platform. And we're also working uh, upstream and downstream. Upstream by working with uh, design companies, so CAD companies, universities, or companies that can provide design, or automated design workflows, so to automate the design of some parts. We're also working downstream uh, with some industries uh, to help them uh, use additive manufacturing in their current supply chain. So we work with uh, industrial suppliers, for instance, uh, to convert uh, their inventories partially into digital inventories. So we have the tools to do it, and we have a partnership with uh, a few manufacturers. Uh, a project, I have to mention also finally, is uh, also uh, connected with the World Economic Forum program. So Automation AI is the uh, AM, so the, the Advanced Manufacturing Hub for North America uh, for the World Economic Forum. So we also connected with similar organizations in the world and exchange uh, what we're learning. And uh, we're happy to share it with other organizations uh, because again, it's a non-profit project uh, with a goal to strengthen small and medium companies. Awesome. So let's take into some content. So we all know in the room that Inherently, additive manufacturing is a digital process, right? Everyone can need a CAD file and to, to get the program moving. So inherently, this is digital manufacturing. So this question is just start with Michelle. Um, on a day-to-day -day basis, as you're talking to customers and throwing out some of these terms of digital thread, digital manufacturing, you know, what's the reception? Kind of, do people have the same definition of what does that mean? I mean in terms of you guys are selling software, so how do you explain the value of connected devices or connected information to the folks you're talking to? It, it is interesting. It depends on where they are in their, their adoption cycle or transformation cycle. So um, I always take it as a start from the beginning, and sometimes it's redundant, but it's easier to make sure that we're on the same page in terms and uh, making sure that uh, we're all talking the same language. Um, so we, I do go through you know every single item and I do I do think that the benefits to a digital thread or digital manufacturing are two things. It's about connecting devices and getting data to, to drive outcomes. And the outcomes can improve the performance of your product, it can improve improve the, the quality of your product and it can also drive optimization. And so like in our in our original platform that we made for desktop, we were able to improve the quality of the products. And so the proof is in the you know, you look at what we've done before and you see the outcomes and you see the adoption that it's, it's driven and it's there. So use cases are important when you're describing digital manufacturing. And, and I know we talk about it like it's a new thing. Uh, I would say back in the late 90s, maybe early 2000s, we were doing this and maybe we didn't call it big data, it was probably little data when we were connecting um, machines and plants and using SCADA, PLCs, and, and doing kind of the same things, but maybe using Excel spreadsheets and databases as opposed to what we're seeing today. So it's just, it's, it's interesting to see the evolution of where we were 20 years ago and where we're going now, and um, just the improvements in, that we're seeing with our, our customers. Right, and so Walter, you're in more of the material space, but that's connected with 
any 3D printed part that you're going to make that's it being an important part of the digital thread. So from your perspective, how do you fit, or how, what's your perception of fitting into the, the IoT environment, the Internet of Things, or digital thread, where it may be both from material supply as well as supplying products that may go into IoT devices? Great. I'm going to answer that, but first I want to kick it back to you. You didn't get a chance to introduce yourself yeah, sure. and tell the, the lovely audience here how awesome you are. So I'm going to kick it to you first to say a few words, and then I'll answer your question. Sure, I'll do that quickly because I think you guys are, have more interesting things to say. But uh, my name is Mike Vasquez. I run a company called Three Degrees up in Chicago. Um, primarily focused on material science, consulting, and helping folks that have adopted and kind of go that next step in qualifying materials and um, validating processes. So we have a software tool that helps do that called Trace, which we inter interact a lot with the, the digital thread, more from kind of the technical data collection piece. And then um, we also have a podcast called Three Degrees Discussion. So anyone who's interested in doing that, um, get me up. So many of the folks on here, Federico, I think was the first victim of that, Michelle's been on it. So um, Air's going to come on soon. So hopefully Walter as well. So, um, so going back to, to the question, so kind of from I'm a materials guy, so this is going to be a biased question. So how do you, how do you fit into, into, into this equation? Yeah, well, so as, as a recovering academic, a professor of material science and engineering, we always talk about these structure, property, processing relationships. And if you've got a resin, you've got a powder, you've got a metal, right, it's a far cry from having that to having an end part. And a lot of how a material is made, how it's processed, and, and what its geometry looks like dictates how it performs. And I think, uh, you know, there was, a, there was a famous landscape architect named Louis Sullivan, who said, form follows function. You build skyscrapers and they're beautiful because they're, they're large and they're functional. And I think as we increasingly are able to micro-architect materials, we can get to these points where something can look like A and behave like B because we're able to so finely micro-architect that material that we can move stresses and strains and, and re react to stress strain tensors in new ways. And, and today, it's kind of coupled with the aesthetics. And so some of the printed parts on the market you know, look beautiful kind of because they're 3D printed but we're moving into this new world that allows engineers to design the internal guts of things to behave perfectly, and designers to design what things look like to be beautiful, marketable, purchasable, and, and IoT, AI, are key drivers uh, for that, that implementation. And especially as we get to, to file sizes and data sizes that, that surpass what we can do today, there are too many bits, too many voxels, too many beams for designers to, to explicitly engineer each one. And so we're moving to this, this need for functional, algorithmic, um, AI-driven, GANs-driven, uh, neural network-driven approaches to micro-architect the insides of materials subject to desired thermomechanical properties. And those resulting materials, whether they're, they're metamaterials or anisotropic materials, will, will have a new generation performance that, that out of the same raw material you won't get if you can architect it differently. And then that's where we see the world heading, and, and we and, and, and partners are very excited about that that world, which is uh, which is here, for sure. And Pierre, you're kind of in the thick of doing, like actually implementing connected printers and all sorts of end-to-end -end processes, not only for a single facility, but a supplier network. So can you talk a little bit about that in terms of what are some of the the learnings you've had in terms of dealing with a lot of different types of companies who are at different stages of adopting technologies as well as may not have even, presumably this may not have even seen 3D printing before you guys kind of reached out. Yeah, so 25% of the members have not, uh, sorry, 25% of the members had some type of 3D printer, but it was not used for production. 75% had zero 3D printing experience. Most of them are, um, People doing CNC machining or other types of uh, you know, manufacturing. So um, th there was a wide range of, of reactions. It's really amazing to see, you know, within the 300 cases that we have in front of us, to see how some members were transformed in the way they were working by just receiving a machine. It's amazing uh, because they they didn't have any 3D modeling capabilities, so they moved into that. Uh, they realize that it's a fully digital workflow on the printer, um, and they think, okay, I need now to move to a digital workflow for my coding ordering process. I need to have them, uh, like the, the, the downstream operations, if possible, also integrated, which is possible with some simple tools. They just didn't have a reason to do it. 
So, so it was interesting. Now we learned a lot of things, uh, sometimes the hard way, uh, because uh, I mentioned we had those three phases, so hardware, software, and, and then the integration upstream, downstream. Uh, but it's actually uh, harder than you think sometimes if you deal with multiple organizations, so you don't control directly the printers, but you need to network with printers that belong technically to somebody else. We had a lot of surprises on the capability and the willingness of uh, equipment manufacturers to connect their printers to an open world. So it's not the case for metal printers. I think the metal printing world, people already have CNC machines that are connected in many cases. So they do have the right interfaces. But the, the polymer printer world is, I think, uh, predominantly uh, a world of proprietary uh, interfaces and, and cloud services that make networking a little bit difficult. So we're in the middle of this, and my recommendation when we talk practically, uh, you know, speaking, what, what do I recommend? Is that when you look at an equipment, whether it's a printer or post processing, uh, talk about the con connectivity of these printers, what standard do they use? Is it an open standard, closed standard? Uh, some manufacturers, uh, even some that are you know, uh, exhibiting, don't even have a connectivity roadmap today, so it was a big surprise. So Federico, jumping off of that thought, as MXD, you're interfacing with big companies, small companies, nonprofits, universities, um, all at different stages of the IoT connected discussion. Um, what are some of the challenges that you're seeing in, in that conversation when you're dealing with people who are pretty advanced and connecting 300 suppliers and universities, and then the one or two machine or machine shop that is just getting their first printer and then you tell them, okay, you just dropped 750K on a metal printer and you need all this software to be connected and to be a supplier for X, Y, and Z. Yeah, no, that's a great point. I mean, you know, during normal times we have about a thousand visitors a month to our uh, future factory floor where we demonstrate a lot of these um, technologies uh, really we you know we're neutral space so it's great because we got a lot of companies that come and, and highlight their technologies but I think what we and I think everyone has said it here you really have to know what you're looking to do right and what you want to measure right because you can get data right at, at any point but what data do you need so if you're not really based in the principles of like most manufacturing outfits like continuous improvement you don't know what you're doing you know, just because you throw on some devices doesn't mean you're going to do anything better, right? It's it, it's not the technology itself. It's using those technologies to uh, enable yourself. And so that's kind of the message we carry. And then once people hear that and see, like, you know, we have solutions that are, you know, a few hundred dollars that some of our interns did over summer that, you know, turn uh, analog equipment into digital equipment, right? that light goes on and, and the people get like, okay, so I know what I need to do, right? Because any manufacturer, they know their process, they know what they need to do. And so it's just making them understand to use these technologies in a way that's gonna make them, uh, you know, really uh, enhance their process. And so we funded, uh, I don't know, over 70 projects, about $85 million. And I think most of these, you can see where these technologies were either um, used in a way to, to create some open source platform or some some level up of technologies that, that people can take that and then build off of that. And I think that's a really important part. Um, as we've said here before, like having things that are available for people to see and test and kind of kick the tire so they really understand what, what's good at that. And, and um, so it's it's been an amazing process to see that maturation. So there are a lot of people that are starting to get it and then kind of diving in deeper, like what more can we do? So, you know, we may look at, at, at verticals, right, manufacturing, but then if you look across, right, from end to end, how do you tie that digital thread through from, right, from the design to manufacturing to end of life to, to service, you can really start taking that thread even farther and using things like AI to, 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 to drive that. And we're still a ways away, but I think people are starting to see that picture and connecting those dots as well, which is exciting. For sure, and I think, I'd like to, you know, for all of you, have a, a deeper conversation on this idea of what data is good data. Because I think all of, all of us on, on, on the stage are collecting information in, in some way. And, um, and starting with, with Walter, like the materials data being at the you know, 
fully constructs materials from the ground up. Like, that's a great tool for some people, not a great tool for others who that's just too much information. So I guess how for, for any of the you up there, what's the right level of kind of dissemination or telling the story of it? How can you use this data and knowing that who's the right person to talk to in an organization to convey this message? Because um, sometimes it may be the engineer, sometimes it may be the designer, sometimes it may be the purchasing officer. So you have to tell different stories. So can you, can you go, just go down the line and just kind of comment on, on what you've seen on, on that front and kind of distilling kind of how do you rank data or information particularly what, to what you're doing? Yeah, at a high level, that's easy. Data that allow you to change your behavior are, are great data. And if you're measuring things and then it leads to indecision or paralysis, it's, it's a waste of time. And so I think having more robust streams with, with less data or more focused data that allow you to do something differently are, are very useful. And data that allow you to be able to fail quickly and iterate, I think are very useful. I can get into a lot more weeds, but at a high level, I think that, that's the most important thing, whether it's materials design or people or logistics or machines or connectivity or slicing or data or designing. So Michelle, you guys are connecting multiple printers and yeah. multiple machines, so there's... It, there's, there's a ton of data, okay. and I would say, you know, there's different profiles of people who, look, who need different slices of the data. So from an IT department, security is important in the 3D printing and in process. You want to make sure your designs are secure. You want to make sure the network work is secure, that there's no, you know, outside, um, you know, attackers coming in on the, uh, the network. And then, um, so there's definitely the IT department. And then design-wise, making sure you have all the revisions and you have the history. And then you have the history of the part, the part passport, or just you know understanding what exactly happened from the design all the way through you know a delivery of a part. And if something happens in the field, being able to go back and say, oh, well, you know, it was this material lot, it was this operator, it was this type of process, and being able to take the data and understand what happened. And that's you know that's across multiple verticals, you know, whether it's automotive, medical, uh, aerospace. And um, so I, you know, I think in operations, just being able to, to measure your operations because like with our platform, it's about driving cost out and making it easy to 3D print, staying in one platform instead of going in and out of different software packages or into different types of OEM equipment because an, uh, a plant manager does not want to go over to one type of printer and have to spend a lot of time trying to get it to work and gathering the data from it and then going over to a different type and then a different type. I mean, it's if you can get it all in one space, then you can say, what's my OEE? What's my utilization if you want to break it down further? And, you know, how many, uh, what's my yield, my rolling yield, et cetera, et cetera. So, so um, I, with our platform, it, there's like so much data, you have to know the owner of the profile that it's going to most benefit person. So I know that's a long answer. Yeah. And so, I could keep so, going, but that's... <laughs> so on that point, um, so who's deciding that? So like, are you as a company, you have data analysts, engineers, kind of, they think, okay, I think I know what the right sales story is, or is it engineers on the other side, on the customer side, where you're dealing with all sorts of different organizations that may or may not have data scientists or folks that are looking at deep statistics of, or you know what to look for. So who's driving that? Usually it's someone in like a VP of innovation or a VP of transformation or additive and or advanced engineering or advanced manufacturing. It's it's a it's a higher level strategy trying to get to the data to make again the out get the insights to, to drive outcomes. And um, if, if you can start at the top that's where you know you should C suite SVP, but a lot of times it's the engineers that you're working with because they have a problem. They come to you with a challenge. I can't do this. I can't do that. This is really hard. And um, and then you start breaking it down and at the end of the day, it is data that right. you end up with. And so, well, uh, here, here, uh, but one thing, so in our case, uh, one thing we've seen is that we, we started way too complex. So we, we start with those tools that can do everything. You can create all the dashboard you want, all the data is there. 
uh, but nobody is really able to articulate how this translates into a saving, um, at least for small and medium organizations, uh, small and medium sized organizations. Uh, what we've seen uh, is if you're able to get small wins, um, so you, you invest just a few hundred dollars on one particular project and you measure the saving or the, the additional revenue that you generate through that, uh, it creates this type of competition between teams in a company and say, hey, I've generated this with this project. Sometimes it seems insignificant to us, uh, but for them it's actually a big win, uh, even though in dollar value it's just, again, you know, a few hundred dollars spent and maybe a few thousand dollar uh, savings. But when, once you get this dynamic going, people have the tools, it's, it's, it's amazing to see the transformation because you start with a small win and then you understand, okay, I invested this much, then, then you can go see the VP of, you know, a generator ops and say, hey, look, can we do the same here because these guys did that and it, it's, it triggers reflection of like a, a yeah, discussion at company level. Uh, but those small wins are amazing and it's amazing to see how the people are enthusiastic about finally getting a grasp of what is IoT or what, what they can do with additive manufacturing and how it actually translates it into the dollar. So, Federico, we kind of danced around the, touched upon it a little bit, the, the issue of cybersecurity. So your uh, MXD is a big focus on manufacturing cybersecurity. And for a small, medium-sized manufacturer, you can tell a scary story, right? North Korea or China, whoever is gonna come and steal your data and then it's gonna compromise all your contracts and you go to business. And the amount of things that are connected now, I mean, if I'm in the shoes of someone kind of building out my infrastructure for um, for digital manufacturing for IoT, I and mean, that's got to be on the top of your mind, and you may cause hesitancy in terms of switching from what you're doing now. I mean, everyone has a phone and is aware of, of data in, in their daily lives. But you know, what have you seen from you know, talking to manufacturers about you know, connected devices, sensors, and building it as part of their digital security strategy? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, I think it, it, it is quite fascinating and, and scary at the same time. I mean, you know, I think 73 or 75 percent of manufacturers, small manufacturers, less than 20 employees, something like that. And, and what they spend maybe a thousand dollars as they can on IT in general, right? They just don't have the budget, but they're running maybe some PLCs and they don't think like, oh, I'm just a small company. I can't, I'm not going to get hacked. And, if you have a PLC and we actually have a wall where we demonstrated how you can attack a PLC from known vulnerabilities from the NIST, you know, website. So um, once they see that, their eyes kind of uh, light up and say, oh, okay, well, well, now what? So we kind of try to go through these basic steps of, you know, training your, your, your workers, right? <clears throat> Humans are still the biggest vulnerability. And in fact, like at a, um, my own IT t team, I was checking an email that was uh, a voicemail that was actually one of their phishing campaign. I was like, nope, oh, nope, for it. So uh, even uh, practicing what we preach. But I think the other things are, you know, kind of um, making those strong passwords, right? Not just taking the defaults that come with the, the equipment you get. Um, and, and you still see that, right? Even though we talk about that, that um, you can do some very simple things like those few that I've just mentioned. Um, you know, there's other applications like uh, whitelisting or that, that allow only the opposite of antivirus, you just have only trusted programs that run on your, say, your hardware, right? So that um, you don't have these problems. So again, these are really simple things that we try to inform people, uh, those small manufacturers, um, and, and uh, you know, we're gonna continue to do that. But I think it's just really raising the awareness because I really don't think that a lot of people understand. It's, it's not a matter of, of um, if you're going to get attacked, but when. And so um, I think that's something that we, we try to focus on and, and do a lot. And so we have some efforts ongoing over the next few years to, to, to help with that. And is there kind of a, a different costing solution that every size manufacturer? So there's lower cost things you can do, versus the, the more sophisticated you get? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, we have some small businesses that have spent tens of thousands of dollars, hundreds of thousands of dollars, of, you know, because they're trying to get ahead of these things, especially if they're providing to the government. So you have the PFARS or CMMC um, that's coming down the pipe. Um, but you know, you know, our objective really uh, later this year we're going to launch a marketplace, 
uh, that will offer low cost or no cost solutions for small and medium sized manufacturers that they can go on and get an assessment, then kind of show, especially if they're a need to do DFARs or CMMC, kind of what are the gaps, what, you know, what kind of products they might be able to use. Um, and so that's our effort. But I know there, there are other organizations that are doing things similar to that. So uh, I think it's going to be a kind of much like additive, a community effort where we have to help each other kind of through that process. And so um, you know, we're, we're trying to do our part, but it's, it's really going to take everyone to, to, to help ourselves in that cybersecurity space. I think uh, last NDIA report was that 35 percent of all cyber espionage occurs in the manufacturing industry, and I think 86 of percent of that is intentional. So it's not even just kind of you know happen. It, they're they're out there attacking, and they're trying to find ways. And obviously, uh, as we always say, it's it's your weakest link where you're going to get attacked. So, you know. and so we've spent a lot of time kind of on the back end of like how do we implement this in kind of a user space and a you know, a factory and a small or large organization, but there's also the concept of, hey, 3D printing is a great solution for some of these companies that are actually implementing IoT devices. So, Walter, maybe you want to speak a little bit about any uh, applications, materials that you guys have put into IoT connected devices. Sure. Yeah, so so being in Dallas, I think Gartner's uh, rated Texas Instruments being in Dallas as kind of the number one company in the world to respond to uh, Internet of Things, Internet of Everything. You know, they make 40 billion chips per, per run or for a few cents each. They get distributed, you know, dozens in an iPhone and hundreds in, in cars and in more in houses. Um, and so in Dallas, there, there's a huge kind of cybersecurity infrastructure around. So a lot of the business luncheons and stuff are always titter with, with that kind of, of talk. Um, and, and so for us, where, where we see additive kind of playing into that, that world, the photoelastomers that we make is this trend toward customization and toward understanding what individuals need. Um, one, one of the strengths of additive, right, is, is a part for you, for your elbow, for your knee, for your foot, a medical device. Um, but how do you design that part for someone? There, there are major gaps in sensing, in scanning, in translating information to individuals, and then aligning that with, with a manufacturing technique, whether it's 300 distributed printers or whether it's centralized printers. Um, and so I, I think the whole ecosystem needs some work so that those kinds of activities can be a lot lower cost. If you've got to have a, a person spearheading a custom design through that whole process, it's already too expensive and it's probably not going to work. So that's where the automation, the AI, some of the machine learning um, can come in, is implementing customization on standard process flows um, to better serve customers. So here, here being near Disney World, you know, for instance, there's a company in Dallas, I think, called the Lone Star Technologies that build the little uh, devices at restaurants where you go get a restaurant, you know, it buzzes you when your table's ready. And it's surprisingly a complicated device. It's, it's got connectivity, but the materials constraints are really hard. People eat those things and drop them on cement. And so that's, that's a simple analog of a kind of device where additive could, could make that great. If it were for, for Disney World, you could have little figurines that are all the Disney characters, but that are still sensing. And then you take that kind of thing and, and look at consumer products, industrial products. As we move to mass customization, we need mass data to enable that mass customization. But we can't have people in that loop proctoring the mass data to get to mass customization. That's a fundamental ecosystem problem that I think has, has been addressed piecemeal but, but, and maybe, maybe some of your companies are doing that, but we, we certainly, as a, as a user and a component of that ecosystem, haven't seen kind of a, a well-oiled machine to do that. And certainly don't have the means to implement all of that ourselves. So I'm really always interested in asking people to reflect on kind of where they are now in terms of kind of adoption of getting their technology or their approaches into the marketplace, whether it's in cybersecurity, reaching manufacturers or new software system. And kind of reflecting on a hypothesis they, they had going into that and kind of where the reality is the road as you start kind of talking to customers. So Gary, you had mentioned kind of one of the things you would do differently would be maybe start simpler in terms of, kind of some of the messaging and some of the data that you're collecting. So are there other kind of aspects of the learnings you've had over the last year in implementing you know, this massive network that you could advise people or that you just kind of take away as, as framing your new model of 
the way this works. Yeah, it's distributed manufacturing. So you know, the IoT uh, allows you to integrate other machines, so you have this protocol, the HTTP based, so you can communicate within your organization, but also outside in a secure environment. And if you don't have a piece of equipment, uh, what we're doing on the Diamond Network uh, is uh, let companies borrow resources from other companies. So if I have a machine and I'm not fully utilizing it and I want to sell some of that capacity, instead of uh, letting that machine idle, uh, I can offer it and uh, somebody knows the availability of my machine in real time and can send me jobs uh, on my machine. It, it, it requires some logistics, so that's why we have uh, a geographically uh, focused approach on Detroit right now, but we're replicating that in, in other regions soon. Uh, we are preparing ways to uh, logistically uh, move fast, uh, including drone transport and things like that, uh, so it's, it's a bit futuristic, but it's actually uh, ready to be implemented. And uh, so by being part of a platform, you can actually benefit from other people's resources in real time. Uh, without going to commercial platforms you know, where they expect a fully finished product from you and they're going to take you know, a high margin, we use a non-profit approach. So the goal is really to strengthen the members. And some members start realizing how they can uh, network and, and, and join efforts with other companies to help each other. So that's on the, the processing side, that's also from the experience point of view. Uh, we have a governance system, it's blockchain enabled, there's all kinds of technologies that allow you to uh, rely on a network of people. I mean, we've all learned to work remotely with people now during the pandemic. In the future, I think we're going to keep doing that also on a manufacturing uh, level, where you can build a group of, uh, of uh, other companies where you help each other. Um, so you have, especially when you're a small and medium-sized company, you have resources that you did not have in the past. And all of that can be monetized very easily. There's some, uh, I would not call that cryptocurrency, but we use uh, uh, a system for like, payments within the network, which is very light, so there's no banking transactions. But just giving an advice to somebody can be monetized. Just you know, cost a few cents or a few dollars or, or much more if you think that it's unique. But uh, it's very easy to buy expertise and to buy uh, services in real time within the network, and it's something that we make companies to work. Could I ask one follow-up to that? Of course. So on, on, on some of this IoT decision making, how much of those efforts are presenting data to humans for them to make a decision, and how much of, of that, that network and that structure is allowing computers or algorithms to make decisions? Because when, when you have humans in the loop, things slow down considerably. And the question is, you know, whether, whether it's through through Bitcoin, through blockchain transactions, through collecting data, you know, where are the decision points, and can some of those start to be taken off the burden of, of your engineers and people, and, and become a little more automated? Yeah. So there, there's all all kinds of levels of automation. So uh, some operations are, uh, let's say, uh, can be fully automated. So if I know that something has a stable process. I can define parameters, uh, I can define a pricing formula, and can accept job automatically. But that's something that we're able to do, so aut automated pricing, automated uh, lead time confirmation, uh, and, and job scheduling. When you have a recipe for a product, for instance, that you have already qualified, uh, if a distributor places an order for that part and the Kanban gets to the point of reordering, it's going to automatically trigger the order through multiple companies if needed. And because the part is already qualified, uh, it will be fully automated. Uh, when it's something that has not been qualified yet, we need a, a manual validation process to make sure that uh, the qualification can be done prior to the product being pushed. Unless it's a prototype and we know there's no requirements, so we can do that. Uh, on the engineering side, it's the same thing. So we have uh, automated design workflows. So as long as the, the part that is being called uh, is within a certain known set of parameters. If I want to design a fixture, like a, a measuring fixture, and I know the parameters, I know the tolerances, uh, it can be fully automated, or let's say it can be almost fully automated. The user needs to upload the, the STL file of the part that needs to be uh, uh, measured, 
<coughs> we need to know on which machine is going to be measured, uh, what are the interfaces. So that can be automated. If you come with a brand new part and you want it to be designed, we're going to have to have a manual process. So what's really important is understanding the capabilities of the process, which parts require validations or not, and then uh, push it through the system if it can be automated, as uh, it's still a, you know, a transaction where you and input is needed. One thing that's important is, you know, we've, we've tried using blockchain uh, at a much wider scale than probably should do. So we really reduced the scale of the blockchain to just uh, payment transactions, uh, history of transactions, but we're not using blockchain to measure now all the steps in manufacturing. It's just useless and, and way too complex. Uh, so we set governance models where the decisions for memberships, but that's also part of the management of the, of the whole uh, organization, uh, with a certain set of governance rules the community can self-manage. So how do we accept a new member? It doesn't need to go through a centralized organization. It can be decentralized through blockchain technology. So, so I'm going to ask one more question. Um, but you in the audience think of something, some things. We have other follow-up questions that we can ask after that. So this one I did not put on the list, so I'm going to surprise you. Um, keep them on your toes. But uh, can the last question, kind of short, kind of, uh, think about this and kind of one or two sentences. Um, so, if you were king, queen of the world, and you're kind of organizing your your manufacturing process and all your companies, kind of what's one problem that you face kind of on a day to day basis that you would like to solve today? That you've been struggling with a challenge that's kind of come up repeatedly. So, does that spring on any? I'll let any volunteers go first. I want to pick on someone specific. I'll give it a try. Um, I think for what I've experienced. Um, over the past year plus here at MXD, but certainly as a former professor, I think it's really a, the workforce of the future. So like, obviously we still need kind of the traditional people, CNC welders, but like, what is that future workforce? What are the skill sets that they need? And what are the things that we need to do? And d does it have to be always in an academic setting, right? How do we set up micro-credentials or work with community colleges and other facilities that can give us that workforce we need. I mean, we're talking about two and a half million jobs going unfilled in the next 10 years because we just don't have the workforce. Yet we have, you know, unemployment, right? So to me, if, if, if I were a king for a day, I'd right, say, hey, this is what we really need to double down on um, and, and, and think about the future. So, you know, whether it's a kind of a jobs for now, but training them with those future skill sets so that they can transition into those future jobs, because I think uh, uh, he's brought up a great point about when, when AI does filter into these areas where you do have humans and then they're kind of left out, you're, you're going to find ways and opportunities to use right, th those humans to kind of take advantage of that information and knowledge and, and kind of go to that next level. So that's what I would focus on. Anyone else? Um, I, I would start with quality, and because uh, I think you could get speed and cost after that. Um, quality, uh, repeatability, and accuracy of parts, and machine machine uh, variability. So you you take that out, um, regardless of whether it's the same OEM equipment or not. And I think once you get you fix quality, I think it will drive more adoption of three D printing, and then you can figure out speed and cost after. I would equip you know, every machine on the floor with a standard uh, communication uh, capability. It's like you know, having a, I mean, everybody has a cell phone, and the, you know, cell phones all have like a camera, uh, an accelerometer, uh, like a radio, whatever, a screen. It's like if we had cell phones today in our plants that, you know, where every component would not communicate with each other. I mean, none of the apps we are using today could be used. And still, it's what we have in the plants. In most cases today, the machines, in, with a few exceptions, are not able to communicate with each other. And it, it's so, so, such a frustration not to be able to create new workflows with, with more automation. Okay. I think maybe going back to, to someone's point about all the small businesses doing manufacturing, for small companies, people are very expensive relative to your output. And in large companies, as you get to economies of scale, the production and efficiency per person goes up dramatically. So it's, it's very difficult for small companies to compete 
on a cost basis without doing something fundamentally different. And so I think if, if we as an additive community um, could find ways to make people you know, more useful, more efficient, um, right now there's you know, maybe a few tools and a lot of people running those tools because the tools are pretty expensive. But if, if that were kind of flipped, if, if we had, we're a team of about 30 back at Adaptive, you know, if, if we had hundreds of printers, we could make our engineers a lot more efficient with some AI. But go back to the points in training, right? It takes a lot of training, a lot of infrastructure, a lot of logistics to get there. But I think for this this whole community to succeed, it would be putting more tools, more printers, more materials in the hands of more people, let, letting people you know, be more creative, let everyone be a designer and have access to, to capacity. And I think today it's, it, it's the other way around. It takes a lot of folks to do a few things. And I think as, as we get a better workforce, as, as we get better education, better automation, a few people will be able to do a lot more to reshape how the world mass manufactures goods and enable small companies to, to compete with very large companies, which, which in the past, you know, maybe they've not had the resources to do at, at some scale. Um, but I think additive kind of enables that and democratizes that. Um, and that, that's good for probably most people's businesses here. You've got a few people buying lots more equipment, lots more materials, um, you know, lots more automation software that's making decisions. There's real value to be added. And so I guess if, if I were king for the day, I would try to find a way to give this whole community lots, lots, lots more money so that we can compete with some of the entrenched manufacturing industries that can do what they're doing because they have these cash cows that are generating billions of dollars a year that get reinvested into archaic technologies, but they just can't be broken into without a lot of capital. And I, th I think we're getting close where additive is going to disrupt those spaces. And uh, I, would, I would kick that a little harder. Awesome. All right, so questions, open the floor. Uh, Chris. Yeah, a comment, I guess, really. Um, it's interesting you talk about the dem democratization of like the industrial equipment, because I, I run a makerspace fab lab at the community college you know, open access for small businesses and Joe Blow off the street, right? And I was just reading a book about the, it's called the Maker, Mo Maker Movement, like the Industrial Revolution or something like that. Have you heard of it? Um, um, I've heard of the Industrial Revolution, oh, okay. not specifically. It's, well, it's, like, it's called like the next Industrial Revolution, I think. But it's, uh, it's very interesting because it compares now where we are with 3D printers to like the printing presses of like the 80s and desktop computers and Back in, you know, printers and computers were first out, people weren't printing their own novels at home, right? And um, I'm very interested in talking to UPR about the Automation Alley stuff because, you know, that's kind of one of our, our goals is to make this equipment very openly accessible to people. Um, the idea of, like, kind of, uh, you know, it's Airbnb, Airbnb style of, like, sharing your house but sharing your, your 3D printer or your CNC with, you know, this company down the street. It's kind of interesting. Sometimes we say the LinkedIn of manufacturing. I don't know if it's the right analogy, but it's like allowing to connect with people that you know and help each other. Yeah. I guess what I'm trying to think of too is, so you're talking about the IoT of connecting the devices. Um, are you like, I guess I'm trying to figure out what the benefit, you know, is it just like a slicer that works for a DED machine, but you can also control this SLS machine? Is that what's going on? So it's not about the slicer. The slicer can be a third-party slicer, or we can actually, in some cases, uh, be a, like the, the slicer that we integrate. Uh, the idea is, once you um, have machines connected together, you know in real time where the lead time is going to be, who's available, and you know the reputation of each node in the network in terms of quality of their work for that particular application. So somebody may be good for a certain material group, but bad for another one, or somebody is good at uh, post-processing a certain you know, process and not another one. So the, the AI knows that, and it will give you a rating for, uh, if you don't know personally the members, it will give you a rating for these members. So uh, if you were, like, we need to think about what's good for the customer. The customer wants to know uh, how he's going to get something Repeatable. So if the part is qualified, you want to make sure that it goes through a qualified process. So in that case, you, as a customer, you have full visibility of who's going to do what, uh, who is the supplier, uh, 
single supplier or a group of suppliers and know exactly who's doing what. Uh, if, you, if you don't know and, and you just throw an order to the system or to one particular company in the network, you will know in real time what your lead time will be. Uh, and you know what the status of your order is. And uh, so, so that's the type of things. Having the machine connected allows you to do that. And then from the outside, you will also know, you know all the metrics about the quality of the part, about the on time, about the, uh, I mean, everything you collect normally in your MES system will be available not just in a single organization, but when you work across organizations. If your printer is disconnected, or if your other equipment is disconnected, you're not able to track anything. It's just going to be manual if it's done, or you just get a notification, hey, the order is shipped, by the way, uh, yeah, we forgot to tell you. Or it's not shipping, by the way, we forgot to tell you, which is even worse. Uh, and and it's, it's really tough, both in prototyping and in production projects. Todd. Um, on your uh, comment earlier, on, on the, the comment that uh, earlier on mass customization requires mass data, and the moment you include a person in the sphere the design workflow is already too expensive. Let's talk about the design of that workflow and needs for design tools, workforce, engineering workforce, development, and research, and how you design the workflow. What do you see as opportunities in that area? Yeah, I think that maybe that's right for the meeting. I thought you were going to say I said that, but these guys are better software people. <laughs> but I'll start, then you can you can yeah. chime in. Um, yeah, I, I think it's an absolutely great opportunity for for investment. This is where academia maybe could help on the ideas side, but enabling systems and architectures that can can be mass accessible. Um, if you take something like you know how, how Microsoft has, has done things to pick on them, they're they're a fast follower. You know, they, they do 80% well for 80% of the folks and, and don't address a lot of the edges sometimes, but, but end up having general, like Excel or, or Dynamics or, or Office 365. I think they've done a fantastic job of taking a lot of the functions needed for, for Office 365, for instance, for a small business and making it accessible with a few clicks. All right, you don't have IT? Great, some of that can be handled for you. You don't have some finance stuff? Great, here's some analytical tools. Here's Power BI to do that. And in, in the same way, if there were accessible platforms where, where people could do very well and, and build great businesses, but they enabled individuals to be more creative and spend more time doing what they're good at and less time managing the, the garbage, the, the, the logistics, the, not that finances is garbage, not that accounting is garbage, not that, that um, different, I don't know, reports and memos and um, you've seen the office or, or you've seen off of space or different movies, right? There's all this bureaucracy that gets wrapped up into engineering sometimes. And the more of that that can be put onto automated systems, I think the better. I, I don't know the right way commercially to implement that. Maybe maybe your company's already doing that. Yeah, that I mean that's kind of what we what our what our solution is. It's about um, optimizing the workflow. And mass customization is obviously what we, you know, is a great use case for 3D printing or ad additive manufacturing. And so being able to, to take, say, like variances of a part and being able to automate that within a, uh, a workflow or be able to capture, like if you're doing, say, dentures or something and you want to keep that denture so that somebody breaks it or they lose it later, you can pull up the file that you had, you know, from two years ago as opposed to go looking for it in a, in a, in a filing cabinet. And that's true that, because that's people. They start writing down all the processes and then, the, the person calls up and says, hey, I need another denture, and can you make the same one for me? And then they're you know looking through paperwork to figure out the part number and what the post-processing was, what the dimensions were, all of that. And so when you can automate that through the different tools in the workflow, it's right on. And that's exactly the, the workflow platform that we built. And depending on your application, it's, you know, it's, it's different for each type of application. Yeah, so just to add, I think uh, one project, because we, we generally, the, the projects we fund come from our members, uh, ideas, we go through a whole iterative process, and one project call that's out right now that you can see on our website is called the AI Design Advisor. So how do you use AI to help a designer that maybe doesn't have a lot of experience make the right decisions, because it's looking through the entire, you know, kind of from the beginning to end, and so 
um, you know, the project calls out. Uh, we unfortunately last month had the pitch session where people were kind of teaming up, but we have like a spreadsheet of people who are interested. So if you wanted to get your name on that list, you can reach out and do that. Um, I mean, again, that's just a small part, but I think all these pieces together start helping that process together. I made one more comment too. I think that the gamification of, of business and the gamification of software is really going to help because when you when you see new tools, it's just overwhelming. I think you mentioned that earlier. You, you don't know what to do. Yes, you could have a perfectly functional piece of software, but without intense training, how do you get there? Well, how do you afford the training? Well, again, human in the loop. It's very expensive, and so you know, adopting things from game mechanics and, and building software that can help people who are very basic, learn how to engage with very complex systems, um, but then having that not be so simple and basic that it gets really boring, but really having that, that gamification extend to advanced levels um, as, as software gets more and more complex, I think will promote much greater adoption of some of these automated tools. So I think this whole industry would do well to look at, look at games and, and game design and how users should interact with software. And lean methodology. If you if you could just take lean methodology and put it in the software workflow. Yeah. So we don't have enough time for. Sure. So we got and then we'll do line and then we'll wrap it. So how or what you see as like the next big step in upskilling existing designers today in order to allow them to design workflows that take advantage of IoT to reach for to to, for simple designers to be able to engage with IoT to sort of force multiply their solutions to a broader audience, where it's applicable to think of prosthetics, for instance, or help automate or lower the skill the skills skills that are required in order to develop effective solutions, to develop or deploy effective solutions. What research do you think should be research or training should be required? get somebody up to where that that kind of development of the middle and that kind of work that was easier. I, I I have my opinion here, especially around the design tools. I'm a mechanical engineer, but I would tell you that one of the best designers and one of the best teams I had is when I hired an art student and uh, from an art academy who was super creative and I put her with uh, some MEs, mechanical engineering designers, and they worked together in that Creativity and the way that they um, they came up with just wild designs and even packing differently than what you would see in traditional manufacturing, so it can be three D printed. So that's that's one thing. And then on the software tools, um, there's some AI that, that we're developing around um, like parts. So when you design a part and then you have something that's similar, then we can give you a template. And so that helps kind of move that creation of the design and it's just another tool, but I'm all about making it simple, kind of that gamification, just like it has to be simple, as, as John will say, it's so, so simple that an eight-year-old can, can run it or do it. So, um, and that is the goal. Otherwise, we're, we're not going to get the adoption. All right. To so just for time, we'll end with one. Thank you. Um, I work for an OEM. A month before the IoT capabilities in the machine, we have a better things we've done is prototyping. But the problem is there are no standards to, to go through. The last thing in the world I think I should be doing is designing a security layer and authentication rules. <laughs> right? That's just a disaster in the making. Uh, and without the right set of standards and tools and best practices out there, the first thing the customer and the defense department, you know, the defense company automotive medical, the first thing they're going to do is plug up the network port and make sure no one goes to it. Um, are there any efforts you guys are aware of in that direction? Um, what can we do as a community to make it aware of, um, both from an OEM point of view, we can do it, but also from a customer point of view, then there's that standardization and allow them to integrate to it. Yeah, so there, there, there are a few standards. Um, um, there's sometimes a war, especially you know between Europe and the US and defense companies. Uh, we personally, or personally, we like uh, OPC UA with the UMATI interface because it's something that's universal. Uh, there's a consortium that was created by uh, CNC equipment manufacturers. 
most of the manufacturers of metal printers are on OPC UA, and, uh, but, but it requires um, a hardware that is not available sometimes on low cost printers. Um, and so there's other alternatives. If you don't have uh, like OPC UA capabilities, you can also uh, work with other standards. As long as you have the right API calls, uh, there's a REST API, so it's like a framework where you know exactly what calls you need to make as a server or as a client. It's relatively simple. Uh, so that first phase is relatively easy to implement. And there are other great solutions, like you know, Michel's company, they, they develop tools like for printers that are not capable of, of, of communicating, so that, that's you know, one option. There's multiple other options. Uh, I think it's, it's more willingness. Uh, the, the issue I've seen is not a uh, possibility technically to do it, it's a willingness of some manufacturers to keep the world centered around themselves. And, and they don't realize that you need to integrate those printers into a manufacturing environment. Just a real quick comment on that. Most of the data models that we've seen on the standards are very opinionated on specific process technologies. You don't have an open data model that allows other process models to fit into it well. They also often don't have bi directional communication a lot of the other pieces that you need to be able to do. Even something that's uh, simple as, for instance, have a friend be able to go out to the server to get the next job. They're really mm -hmm. Direction. You agree? Yeah. yeah, and I agree too. I know there's efforts around standardization on that, but we, our company, we've connected with NASA and Navy and Google. Google took a long time from a security standpoint just because there's so much to go through, but it can be done, and uh, it has been done. So you know, if we want, if you want to talk offline, we can do that. Not to make it a sense. I'm going to make one more comment there, but I think what will solve that is, is good old-fashioned capitalism, where, where there is tremendous value that is created. We, we will force standards to exist to keep up with that value. And so I think as, as additive moves from low-volume and mid-volume prototyping into real manufacturing, um, that, that will happen. It will happen naturally. Companies will demand it. They will demand multiple sources. Um, but again, when, when the human in the loop is so expensive and the volumes are so low, it's hard for federal agencies to justify putting the resources towards this because it's supporting such a small fraction of our economy. In our space, there's $120 million market for additive elastomers and a you know, $120 billion market for elastomers and foams. When we're a bigger fraction of that market, I think the, the need for standards will be there. Yeah, just real quickly, I'd say given what's going on right now, politically right and all this push about infrastructure. I mean, I think this is a great place for people to advocate in, in terms of infrastructure, that digital infrastructure, like a baseline that we can work off of so that we can all benefit. So I think that's another avenue to, to pursue and the things that we're, we're looking at. Awesome. Well, thank you everyone for the good conversation. So we'll be here for, I think we have the room for another 25 minutes or so. So if you want to come up and ask questions, but thank you so much.